What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network, continuing the reading of The Ethics of Money Production by the great Jörg Guido Holtzmann, published by the Mises Institute. Today, Chapter 4, uh, Part 4, Fighting Deflation. Still, another variant of the same basic fallacy is that we just discussed is the alleged need to fight deflation. The word deflation can be defined in various ways. According to the most widely accepted deflation today, a definition today, deflation is sustained decrease of the price level. Older authors have often used the expression deflation to denote a decreasing money supply, and some contemporary authors use it to characterize a decrease in the inflation rate. All of these definitions are acceptable depending on the purpose of the analysis. None of them, however, lends itself to justifying an artificial increase of the money supply. The harmful characteristic of deflation is today once one of the sacred dogmas of monetary policy. The public spending, the public speeches of the chief monetary po policy furnishes ample evidence in support of this contention. Professor Benemke, the present chairman of the Fed, is especially outspoken on this issue. The champions of the fight against deflation usually present six arguments to make their case. For an overview, see Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, deflation in their annual report. On the latter volume, see Nicholas Gerchev's excellent review essay on the quarterly journal of Austrian economics. One in their eyes is that the matter of historical experience that deflation has negative repercussions on the aggregate production and therefore on the standard of living. To explain this pre presumed historical record, they hold, two, that deflation incites the market participants to postpone buying because they speculate on ever lower prices. Furthermore, they consider, three, that a declining price level makes it more difficult to service debt contracted at a higher price level in the past. These difficulties threaten to entail, for a crisis within the banking industry and thus a dramatic curtailment of credit. Five, they claim that deflation in conjunction with sticky prices results in unemployment. And finally, six, they consider that deflation might reduce nominal interest rates to such an extent that a monetary policy of cheap money to stimulate employment and production would no longer be possible because the interest rate cannot be decreased below zero. Oh, for sure they are trying. However, theoretical and empirical evidence sustain substantiating these claims is either weak or lacking altogether. For recent Austrian analysis of deflation, see the special issue on deflation and monetary policy in the quarterly journal of Austrian economics. As see also Murray Rothbard's The America's Great Depression, amazing book, and Man, Economy, and State. Um, First, in historical fact, deflation has had no clear negative impact on aggregate production. Long-term decrease on the price level did not systematically correlate with lower growth rates. And those that prevailed in comparable periods and or countries with increasing price levels. Even if we focus on deflationary shocks in emanating from the financial system. Empirical evidence does not seem to warrant the general claim that deflation impairs long-term growth. See George Selgin, less than zero, and Michael DiBarbo and Angelo Rettish, is deflation depressing? Uh, evidence from the classical gold standard. Uh, and A. Atkins and P. J. Kiho, deflation and depression. Is there an empirical link? A spoiler, nope. Second, it is true that unexpected strong deflation can incite people to postpone purchase decisions. However, this is not by any sort of necessity slow down the aggregate production. Notice that in the presence of a deflationary tendency, purchase decisions in general and consumption in part particular does not come to a halt. For one thing, human beings are under a, the, the, the constraint of the stomach. Even the most n notorious misers who cherish saving a penny above anything else must make a minimum of purchase just to survive the next day. And altogether, that is the great majority of the population will by large buy just as many consumer goods as they would have bought in a non-deflationary environment. 
even though they expect prices to decline in the future. They will buy goods and services at some point because they prefer enjoying these goods and services sooner rather than later. Economists call this time preference. In actual fact, then, consumption will slow down only marginally in a deflationary environment. And this marginal reduction of consumer spending, far from impairing aggregate production, will rather tend to increase it. The simple fact that all resources that are not used up for consumption are saved, that is, that they are available for investment and thus help to extend production in those areas that previously were not profitable enough to warrant investment. Third, it is that it is correct that deflation, especially unanticipated, unanticipated deflation, makes it more difficult to service debt contracted at a higher price level in the past. In the case of a massive deflation shock, widespread bankruptcy might result. Such consequences are certainly deplorable from the standpoint of the individual entrepreneur capitalists who own the firm's factories and other productive assets when the deflation the deflationary shock hits. However, from the aggregate social point of view, it does not matter who controls the existing resources. What matters from this overall point of view is that the resources remain intact and be used. Now, the important point is that the deflation does not destroy the resources physically. It merely diminishes their monetary value, which is why they present ownership, why the present owners go bankrupt. Thus, deflation by and large boils down the redistribution of productive asset from old owners to new owners. The new impact of production is likely to be zero. One might argue that even though deflation had no negative impact on production, the aforementioned redistribution is unacceptable from a moral point of view. We will discuss some aspect of this question in the second part of the present book. In the sec section dealing with the economics of legalized suspension of payments. Fourth, it is true that deflation, more or less, directly threatens the banking industry because deflation makes it more difficult for bank customers to repay their debts and because widespread business failures are likely to have direct negative impacts on the liquidity of banks. However, for the same reason that we just discussed, while there might be devastating for some banks, it is not for the society as a whole. The, current, the crucial point is that bank credit does not create resources. It channels existing resources into other businesses and then those which would have used them if these credits had not existed. It follows that a curtailment of bank credit does not destroy any resources. It simply entails a different employment of human beings and other available land, factories, streets, and so on. In the light of the preceding uh, considerations, it appears that the problem entails by deflation are much less formidable than they are in the opinion of present-day monetary authorities. Deflation certainly has much disruptive potential. However, as will become even more obvious in the following chapters, it mainly threatens institutions that are responsible for inflationary increases of the money supply, and almighty oh they deserve it. It reduces the wealth of fractional reserve banks and their customers, debt-ridden governments, entrepreneurs, and consumers. But as we have argued, such destruction liberates the underlying physical resources for new employment. The destruction entails by deflation is therefore often creative destruction in the Schumpeterian sense. See Joseph Schumpeter, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy. Finally, we still need to deal with the aforementioned fifth argument. Deflation in conjunction with sticky prices results in unemployment. And with the sixth, sixth argument, deflation makes a policy of cheap money impossible. Because these arguments are of a more general nature, we will deal with them in the separately in the two next sections and in the two next videos. Thank you very much here for joining me on the chapter on how to fight deflation of the ethics of money production, written by Arkita Hulsman and published by the Mises Institute. Thanks everyone for watching and see you on the next show. Bye bye.